Hello. Thank you for coming to our breakout room. I'm Dave Minnick. I'm the head of operations. and I, I'm Brandon Snyder. The, uh, I'm over supply chain for Plug. And we'd like to thank our entire legal team for coming to this one to make sure we don't say anything we shouldn't. <laughs> so... With that being said... <laughs> Let me know when you finish. <laughs> so we were we were asked to come and talk to everybody that wanted to join about ramping the manufacturing and supply chain operations, which are super important, obviously, for what we have in front of us over the next six years. So to kind of start, we want to talk about where we are right now and kind of where we're going over the next few years. Um, so when you look at Plug just a few years ago, I think someone said it earlier today, we had one factory and that factory was over in Latham and I think the company did a damn good job of getting as much out of that facility, that very small facility as they could over the years. And when you look at what we're trying to do over the next several years, it became apparent that we needed more space, and we needed, to set, we needed to set a groundwork for us to be able to be successful to achieve these plans. So with that came along opening up two new flagship facilities, both here in the state of New York, right? So the first one being the facility that you're in today, which is our Vista Manufacturing Facility. Hopefully everybody went on a tour. Um, today, as you saw, we have Gen Drive and stationary manufacturing inside this building today. Uh, in 2024, we have plans of transitioning the balance of our uh, progen and gen fuel into this facility. The progen is the new engine that Merrill and the engineering team continue to modify and, and make excellent for our stationary products as well as for our on road applications. And then the gen fuel integration is the fueling, the, 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 the gen fuel is the apparatus in which we're able to fuel the applications out in the field, right? And then in 2025 and beyond, you know, we have targets and we're going to be working hard to make sure that we can deliver capacity of 80,000 gen drives a year out of this facility, stationary of 500 units per year, progen of 20K per year capability, and gen fuel of 200 and 250 per year capability. Going further west, in West New York, the facility that you were at last year in Rochester is our flagship facility for our stack manufacturing and for our electrolyzer manufacturing. So many of you who may have been in that facility last year, if you haven't been there since, I would highly recommend going there because it looks much different today than it did then. We're really, really proud of where we are there today. And we think we have an upper bound um, capability beyond what we originally committed to when we first broke ground in that facility. So <clears throat> today we are coding our own MEAs and we are building our one megawatt and our fuel cell high power stacks in May of this year, we were able to establish capacity and prove out 100 megawatts of the one megawatt stack in one month. That was a huge achievement for us. We have goals of getting that much further as we look forward to 2025 and beyond. In 2024, we have plans of transitioning the balance of our liquid cool stack and air cooled stack manufacturing into that facility to make that our stack manufacturing center of excellence here in New York, and we'll transition the balance of our ELX product and some of the outside processing into that facility as well. And in 2025 and beyond, we're putting plans together to go beyond the 2.5 gigawatts to five gigawatts, and then to 2035 gigawatts and beyond, okay? As well as 200,000 fuel cell stacks per year. There you go. Brandon? So just to talk a little bit about the electrolyzer assembly, you obviously won't see the, these built in the uh, two facilities Dave just talked about. Um, but the electrolyzer systems, they're, they're large. They're about, you know, they're uh, sometimes containerized 40-foot systems, uh, oftentimes even bigger. Um, so what th there's, these are a lot of times tied to our utility customers and specific uh, 
regional customers. And so this has really pushed us into a strategy where we've got a global footprint. We're looking at a lot of capacities. We've got a lot of options, and we continue to build that out uh, to have partners in each region that can help us build uh, for what our customers are looking for, some of that certification specific. Um, some of it is you know, custom integration for a specific customer for some of the large installations that I think you may have heard uh, Sanjay talking about earlier today. Um, but having the right flexibility is, is super important. We're industrializing this product. It's taking what is most industries have considered sort of a custom fabricated product, and we're building it with a manufacturing strategy. So no one else in the world is taking this sort of approach to large scale, just, just, just really taking a huge share uh, of, and, 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 and for both a cost and a capacity uh, product that we can bring to, to customers that no one else can touch by using this manufacturing approach with these large scale systems. Uh, there are a number of things that we're doing within these systems that are really exciting with the 5 megawatt systems, the 10 megawatt systems, I think you may have seen some models of in the other room and Sanjay talking about. Uh, but there's a lot of partners that we're working with that have given us, uh, we've got proprietary licensing agreements with our deoxy dryer systems. There's, we've got a technology in that space that we believe is world leading, having worked with pretty much everybody in the globe that produces this type of a, of a, a balance of plant system. Uh, we've got volumes in the hydrogen space that are globally un, un, they're, they're globally competitive in terms of nobody else is able to bring the type of purchasing power that we are with the power electronic systems, which are really critical to uh, to, to the efficiency of the overall electrolyzer system. So we've got a excellent we've got an excellent position there, and then there's a lot of suppliers and, and, and partners that we've worked with to develop you know proprietary diffusion bonding amongst a bunch of kind of other things that have not necessarily listed out here. Uh, and we've got exclusivity. We're building that into, uh, within each step of, of building out this hydrogen supply chain, which doesn't exist, you know, we're being the front runner in, in, in this race, uh, we're able to get a really good position and a lot of exclusivity with a lot of the, uh, the supply chain partners. And, well, and we've, and we've been participants in a lot of that innovation too, right? Especially with, especially with diffusion bonding. So. It's new technology that we're not just integrating into the supply chain, but we're actually actively working with those teams and those companies to, to ramp that technology, which I think is pretty cool. I don't mm -hmm. know who else is doing that. Uh, just making a reference here, I think Alpha ECC is one of our partners that you'll see a little map uh, here in a second. where We've got our own facility that has been built out. We've got uh, a, a grand opening of that, I think, believe that later this month. Uh, we've also got similar types of organizations setting up with uh, some of our uh, Mideast partners and others to have, to make sure that we've got that space uh, dedicated to all of our needs so that we can uh, uh, be extremely responsive uh, with a lot of the, 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 the really the, the booming business uh, for Electrolyzer. From a, uh, we are working on a vertical integration plan as well. So we aren't exclusively going to work through partners. We're obviously not going to be in every region of the world all at once, but there's some sort of, I would say, tweaks that are happening within the product to kind of move from a design to fabricate to a design to assemble, and looking to do some of that work here in the US uh, uh, with plug employees in the future. And understanding which parts of that system that we want to actually assemble and manufacture ourselves that fall within our skill sets and which things we're going to continue to leverage the outside supply and fabrication base on. That's a super important piece of this and why it doesn't make sense for us to do everything ourselves right at the beginning, right? The amount of capital that we go into that is insane, and we're not sure we'd see the return on investment. But it's certainly something we have to think about long term. It's really sticky. All right. I'm so really good at this. <laughs> So from uh, the, this is a uh, this is maybe not some of you may have seen this before. This is some of the current fabricators we're working with. This doesn't list all of them. Uh, there's actually a number of other sort of you th consider it sort of tier two, tier three so, so, uh, fabricators that we're working with globally for different trades and components. But this this is this is the network that we we're covering today. There's another. I, I believe it's 29 different suppliers that we will have completed the next round of bidding on uh, this Friday, in fact, uh, and we're doing some additional selection to kind of consolidate what we're doing in North America. Uh, so some of these names may change, but if we were to include just the scope of the number of global fabricators that we're working with, it would just put, like I said, about almost another, th almost another 30 dots on the screen 
Uh, so there, there's a, a ton of activity going on in this space and it's really, really core to our business to be able to scale quickly and to have the right design partners, customization partners that we need to basically meet any need that we have in the market. So when you look at this factory, we talk about building blocks for expansion, right? So when you're out on the floor today, you saw the stationary area set up with, I think, six build bays. The initial design, I think I stole this directly from Diana and Nate, who put this together. So the, the, the first layout that we did, it was four build bays with the flow subassembly lines, the stock bin carts. It was, it's a pretty easy process to look at and understand, right? But I think the, the great part about the architecture of this particular cell is we have plans to expand to eight, right, we're already at six, and then further plans to expand to 12, right? Once we get to 12, there's really internal like ramp strategies that we'll be using to make sure that we can fully utilize the capacity within the factory before we look at additional capital investments, right, to, for new buildings and things of that nature. So maybe this, First comment might not be specific for stationary, but I think generally everywhere it's really important that uh, a, a supply chain team is looking out at risks and trying to manage those ahead of time because it can take a long time to respond to significant disruptions. And what we're doing in this space with the global di diversification is really, we've really turned that up a lot. We've really put a lot more resources on making sure that we have one globally competitive cost advantages but also that we're, we're ready from a, there's uh, global instability locations. There's also a lot of regulatory what ifs. And so making sure that we're able to bring in the amount of local content that we need for any of these potentialities uh, with, with each region is super important to the supply chain team. So this is something that we've been doing a ton of work on. And then, and then you know, consequently, I think we see a lot of cost benefits out of staying really on the, the edge of what regions, what suppliers, what commodities, what the part pricing should be. Uh, it's, it's really becoming core to what uh, Plug needs to do to be competitive. Um, so, yeah, and similar to Brandon's side on the supply chain side, on the manufacturing side, this is really, sure, this is the strategy for stationary, but I think you could expand this to all of our products, right? Like, really driving towards a best practice from manufacturing, industrialization, industrialization perspective. And, you know, when we talk about the stationary product by itself, like, the folks from Plug understand what I'm going to say here, but a lot of the folks outside of Plug won't. Like, there was a lot of work, a lot of late nights, probably some tears, a lot of pain that went into getting those first ones built, right? But like, this is a first of its kind product. Like, nobody else has done this. Others will start to do this, but nobody else has something like this operating in the field, right? So that's what that's what innovation feels like, and I think that's what Plug is delivering beyond what any of our competitors are doing right now, right? A lot of people are talking about what it's gonna look like and we say this is what it looks like and we're collecting data on these things out in the field as we speak, which I think is a huge competitive advantage for us when we, when we think about long term, right? So we talked about 12, 12 bays, we talked about in-process inspection, you know, legacy or, or new manufacturing processes regularly set up a production line and it gets to the end of the line and they start troubleshooting everything that's wrong, right? So we're, we're evolving as a company and we're moving towards in-process testing, in-process inspection because the worst place that you can find a defect is at the customer, right, obviously. The second worst place you can find a defect is at the end of the line. It costs you almost as much and it's a real pain in the butt. So we wanna catch them real time, in-process, put the data into our MES system and really use that as training tools and feedback tools for our technicians, right? Who are probably the most important, not probably, those are the most important folks in any company, right? Because they're the ones that we need to support. They have the best ideas. They're the ones that are bringing the bottom line and the revenue into the organization, right? So, and then automated factory acceptance testing. Everything's been exceptionally manual here for a long time. So as we move towards more automated testing, less interpretation, red and green, green means go, red means bad, like it makes it a lot easier for anybody on the floor to become an expert on that build process and that product, right? We don't need to lean as much on Merrill's team who should be developing our next generation products. We don't have to lean as much on Nate and Diana who are gonna be going out and building the next version of whatever the next cool thing we're gonna do is, right? And we need to be able to own that within manufacturing by itself. And then when we talk about capacity utilization and factory utilization, you know, in May or in June, we were in Rochester, we talked about you know, we, we may have filled up the ground in this factory, but how do we cube out this factory? Go vertical, right? 
like use every, every part of the cub cubic space in that factory that we can before we invest heavily into new buildings. Well, here we have the opportunity where we still have space, but we're on, not on a 24-7 schedule yet. So before we start investing heavily into new buildings, we'll invest heavily into people, and we'll try to take advantage of every single hour of the 168 hours in a week that we have, right? Because that's what, that's what world class looks like to me, and that's what we're used to in automotive and semiconductor and things like that, and that's who we want to be, right? So. I guess it's time for questions. That was almost 15 minutes exactly, I'd like to point out. Uh, there was an order uh, announced by Cell Impact last week. Is that for plates or for new equipment? You want to take that one? Yeah, uh, I think it's, uh, at, th at this point, that's just for uh, material. So that would be in the plate space. Plate or plate material, yeah. And is it because you can't produce enough currently? No, we have, uh, there's sort of a, uh, so Cell Impact has helped us to scale some of some of the operations that we have here. So we're, it's kind of the way we look at it as a little bit of a sister site. So that it's not bad to have some manufacturing capacity in Europe as well as in the U.S. And so we kind of use there's 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 some share of volume that we work with them. The 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 level of investment was not very big either, right? Million. It was a couple million, yeah, yeah. Uh, when we were at Rochester uh, last year, it appeared that there was space in each step to basically double the lines. Have they been doubled yet? When you were in Rochester last year, you had a factory that had equipment coming in that had yet to be installed. Um, if you walked through Rochester today, you'd see a factory that's humming with activity. Um, the clean rooms are filled. Uh, we're actually looking at bringing more into our uh, insourcing more uh, manufacturing. We think we have more capability and capacity than we originally designed the factory for. And that coating line is running by itself right now. We're not using outside toll coders at all. So. Rochester looks a lot different. It looked a lot different back in June when some of the investors came out. It looks even more different today. And it'll continue to ramp up and, and get filled up. Uh, during your presentation, you made reference to competitors a few times. So I'm just wondering who do you see as your competitors? Um, how do we define those? That's a good question. Am I allowed to answer that? It helped me if you said no. Just kidding. <laughs> so, so, I mean, the Ballard. I mean, you have you you have other hydrogen companies out there, right? Which are obviously a competitor. But for me, you heard Andy talking about this. Go ahead. But the, the, it, Plug is extremely diversified. Yeah. So there's no one else that I think has the breadth of offering that Plug is taking on. It's a very, it's as an industry, it's a vertically integrated industry requiring all sorts. So. We don't really have anyone that competes in all spaces that we do. I think what you might have been referring to was with the high power stationary product, and there was at least two other Ballard. competitors out there that are. Uh, I'm not going to list them exactly, but there are at least two others that we're very familiar with that uh, they're they're trying to develop pro products, but we know that they're probably much earlier in the product life cycle. Is that is it helpful or? <laughs> this isn't uh, this isn't a judgment or just an observation, but um, when I think of like a like a gigafactory, I sometimes think of automation. And when we were touring the plant, you kind of see people hand turning screwdrivers. And uh, I, maybe that's a torque thing. Maybe that I'm just wondering, um, is that what it's going to be, or is that just for now? Or so I, I think it's how you contextualize the gigafactory. Right? It really depends on the products that you're building and. When you look at the products that we're building here from an applications perspective, um, these products are, are heavily manual, right? Um, there's things that we are working on that we will do from an automation perspective, like you're talking about torque and angle and, uh, and, and, and those types of tools, so we can record those things automatically. FAT testing like, will likely end up adding automated conveyance in some capacity of some sort in the factory or automatic loads for some of the engines into the, the stationary units. But, for the products that we're building here, we're likely looking at like a high people investment, right? And for the products that we're building in Rochester, we're probably looking at a high CapEx investment. Does that make sense? 
So when you walk through an automate, like an, uh, when you walk through an automated factory, um, just because it was the most previous experience, like our driving at line in the Gigafactory and uh, at Tesla it was a highly automated line, but the energy products line were heavily OPEX, right? Because they were products very similar to what we're building today here at Plug, right? So it took a lot of people, like with tools that made their job easier, that you could automate, you could automate feedback and testing, but automating the actual process in and of itself starts at the design phase. And, and, and currently the products that we have in this facility are, are, are probably not the products that are gonna lead us to a highly automated facility. Not at this time, that's yeah. not You might wanna bring up SAT though, because we've done some automation in the testing at the end of the line. Yeah, so we used to have a, a heavily manual, you know, hook the engines up and run a, run a, run a test and interpret the data. And now it's hook up, run, green, red, go, right? So automation, it's a, it depends on how you define automation, right? So here we'll automate every step that we can from a testing perspective to make sure it's easy as possible, but a highly automated factory for you know, running harnesses, hoses, and things of that nature is highly complex and likely not worth the investment. Yeah. At a previous Gigafactory, you, there was probably areas that were highly automated, and that would be more flow type manufacturing, similar to what you'd see in Rochester. Uh, and those areas were more automated when you went down to like battery pack assembly. Yeah. Those were people with tools, uh, even in the largest of gigafactories. So there's some, it, it'd be, in the, and I think we're, it's, it'll be very much the same here. Supply chain issues uh, gone away? Are there problems still sourcing parts? Uh, no, you know, I think we, we, this is something that Bridget and I talk about every quarter. Uh, I think the uh, from a COVID perspective, we're seeing, I mean, COVID protocols are pretty well, for the most part, behind us. I mean, they're, they're not a material impact to what, anything we do. The logistics costs, you can look at this global spot price of containers and things like that. We've, 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 we've come to a much more comfortable place. Uh, I think the only thing that we're seeing in a big way continue is still to be labor. Uh, definitely in high cost regions, it's difficult to onboard people. Even in, even in what we consider low cost regions, are, I'm, I'm surprised at how long it takes to staff up teams and to scale up some of the operations in some of these places. So I think, I think we still see labor tightness. Um, and then the other supply chain issue that we saw last year, it was all about inflation. There was a little bit of a commodity super cycle going on. A lot of that seems to have really settled down. If you look at you know, things that we track closely, like you know, stainless steel and platinum and iridium and things like that, are, they're, they're, they seem to be a little bit more normalized right now, particularly recently, actually. We're getting a pretty good, pretty good spot price on a lot of those things. So uh, for the most part, we're, we're doing we're doing better, we're just getting ready for the next one, I guess, and that goes into that global regionalization strategy and dual sourcing strategy. This is highly awkward. <laughs> I mean, let me, let me, this is, this is how I can, this, this, that's an easy answer. No, we are, we are not union now. That's a good question. So I, I, 
Ro- Rochester was a Ro- Rochester was influenced by the fact that that's where the American Fuel Cell team was. That was highly legacy General Motors, right? That's where they lived, and you have the you have RAT right there. There was a lot of fuel cell manufacturing and design experience within that area, so it made a ton of sense, right? For us, um, selecting the other location of Vista, I mean, this is this is this is where Plug's home is, right? Plug's been committed here for a very long time, and we have a very good relationship with the state. We have a very good relationship with um, our local, um, with all of with with the entire the local government here, right? So there was really no other option than than expanding manufacturing here in the capital area, right? Before going and looking at investments, you know, outside of New York, if that even ever happens. But um, this is Plug's home, right? I think Andy says that on a relatively regular basis. So it was a it was a no brainer for us. It wasn't a basic question, it was a good question. This is real quick. This is Meryl. She's our VP of Engineering. In case, yeah. Um, we start with the product roadmaps. So we're working on those. Oh, sorry. So the it's it's it starts with the product roadmaps that we have from our our general managers, and we we go from there and we'll identify the products we want to create, put a timeline together, and then we work with MPI that works with. Um, Dave Mendick's group to help develop the manufacturing process associated with those new products. So it's way up front. He knows about it. His team knows about it. We're working together when we start a product. Meryl, we're working on some next gen right now, several, yeah. several years out. Would you care to comment? Yeah, I, I don't know what I can say. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, we're working on a gen three. Yeah, right now we're working on a two year process for a new. Um, high efficiency um, Gen 3 stack for our automobile applications, I can say that. Okay. And, and, and a lot of the... stationary as well. We have two. Yeah. We have two. So. But a lot of the, the development timeline, the prototype, <laughs> proof of concept, the type of way that we work those through supply chain and, and customer acceptance and review, it's, it's all very much sort of mirrored off of what I've seen at other automotive companies. So we, we definitely follow the same processes and it's we're going up beyond much more than just two years but the two years is really where things get pretty aggressive I would say as we're configured today no um, I believe when we look at vertical integration of things like electrolyzer systems, George, um, we're going to be looking at additional capital investment for new products. Um, I believe that we can support our, our stack manufacturing in the footprint that we have today, our MEA manufacturing in the footprint that we have today, and our, and our gen drive and progen and, and that ramp to the $6 billion. But for some of the other products that'll be coming down the road, I think that there will be conversations about, you know, additional space requirements. Yeah, I'm actually really happy you asked that question, George. Um, I think there's a huge benefit to consolidating rooftops here in the capital region. So out of necessity, we've kind of, we have footprints all over the place because we didn't, we weren't able to expand really further in any of the location that we were. So to answer your question, yes, like, and we're actively working on a strategy on how many rooftops we can start to sublease and let out and bring everything as we, as, as much as we possibly can into this facility. I mean, why wouldn't you want to be here? This place is awesome. I mean, it's beautiful. Like, there's activity out there. It's in a good spot. I mean, this is this is where plugs like Heartbeat should be for the capital region, in my opinion. So. If 
15 seconds. Well, thanks. Thank you.